Dr. Welcome. Um, how many of you were old enough in the 90s to remember you know, what was going on, like you know, Nirvana? Like two people were old enough in the 90s. Good. But three. Wow, wow. It's a whole crowd of like old, old people like myself. Um, well, you might remember, depending on which country uh, you were in back then, that there was a massive craze for pet ground squirrels at the time. Um, you know, they're, they're very cute. And so they, they had to be imported massively, notably into, into Europe, because they, they, there aren't many, at least of the small kind of, um, of, of ground squirrels, there aren't that many that are local. There are marmots, but those are pretty big and not wonderful pets, I'm told. Um, so Dan Davis in the Unaccountability Machine tells this story that in April 99, 440 uh, ground squirrels arrived in Schiphol um, on a KLM flight, but without proper import documentation. Um, and they couldn't be delivered uh, because the exporter refused to pay the cost of, of fixing the problem. And as a result, the, um, the airport staff threw all of those uh, little squirrels, apart from like, I think two or three that managed to escape, uh, into a, um, an industrial poultry shredder that was there um, for that purpose. I'll spare you what uh, a poultry shredder looks like. I, you know, just, this is the moment right before it. It's what the poultry industry uses to, to get rid of male chicks that are considered useless. Um, and you know, it turns out that when you shred, uh, shred sorry, uh, a few hundred little furry things, uh, people kind of get mad at you. And so indeed, it caused a, a pretty big scandal at the time in the, in the Netherlands. But it was very difficult to figure out whose fault it was. Uh, no one could really go like, you know, this, this is the person to blame. They should, be, they should be reprimanded for that. The Dutch government had, you know, on its side, uh, set rules that prohibited importing um, animals that might spread infectious diseases. That's pretty reasonable. That's fair. Um, KLM, you know, the airline, uh, had a process to comply with those requirements. That's also fair. Now, the ground staff at the airport could have maybe paused and wondered, like, should we really be shredding squirrels? Is that really part of our job? But, you know, in practice, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's challenging to, to ask that someone who's on a minimal wage working, working at an airport, like, overturn government policy and, and airline policy. It's, it's pretty unrealistic. And so there was no obvious appeals process. There was no obvious person to blame. So people here and there apologized, but it was unclear um, how things could have gone differently in that context. And the reason that, was, uh, that things happened that way is because of the way that accountability had been structured. Accountability is a pretty straightforward idea. Um, accountability is a relationship between the people who make a decision and the people who are affected by that decision, so that you can have basically a feedback loop. You know, I decide something for you, and you can say, well, this sucks. Um, and the feedback might be just like, you know, someone pushing back, providing information that they don't like it, all the way up to, you know, using a guillotine and decapitating someone. Or, of course, you know, in democracies, usually like not voting for someone, voting them out, that kind of stuff. And this is, this is important in governance systems, because without feedback, well, it's unclear what the, the decision makers uh, can maintain good, good, you know, good decision making. And so that's what's called, what happened here in the squirrel's case, is what's known as an accountability sink. Basically what happened is the decision makers delegated the decision making power to a set of rules, to a rule book, to you know, a relatively autonomous uh, decision making system that is implemented by an administrative staff and you know, people who execute it, but basically by following that rule book. The rule book has decisions that you know, uh, apply to the people who are affected by it, but the feedback that, that those people might provide goes into a hole. There's no way for them to provide that, that information back. And that's what happens when you try to design systems of governance that, are, you know, that, that can operate on their own. And this, I say autonomous, this is from way before we had DAOs or anything like that. Systems can be autonomous, even if they're implemented by human beings, so long as the incentive structures are there to, to keep it that way. And, you know, accountability sinks are not always bad. Um, there are plenty of cases where you don't want a human being to make every single decision for every single thing that might impact a person. 
you know, it's good to have rules that are set and that you know, can be referred to over and over again. It's good to have laws. Um, the problem is, once you start delegating these decision-making powers to, again, a system that sort of operates more or less on its own, you need to answer a number of questions. And you know, the, one of the questions is, are these the right rules at all, and how do we know? Um, how do we make sure that when I write down the rule, it actually gets implemented in practice? It's, it's a real-world rule, not, not a made-up one in, in my mind, right? Who gets to decide the rules in the first place? Who has the authority to create them? And of course, the feedback, you know, rules change, uh, the world changes, some unexpected things might happen. How do you bring that information back into the system to make exceptions, uh, to adapt the rules, to change the rules over time? And you know, basically, who, who, who processes it? How is it processed that way? And that matters quite a lot you know, if, you're, if you're a scurry of squirrels that is waiting uh, on an airport tarmac about to be shredded. And the thing is, like, once you start answering these questions, once you start working on the details of these questions, figuring out what these rule books are, what, what, how best to process them, how best to make them work, what you're actually doing is politics. Now, a lot of people sort of like step back at that and like, they're like, oh yeah, you know, I, I do technology. I'm not, I'm not really into that, that whole politics stuff. But that's because people think of politics as, you know, that annoying uncle who keeps going on about whatever he saw on, 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 on a news channel or whatever. Or they think about, you know, those parties, political parties that can often be stupid even, if, even when you agree with them in, in, in the behavior. But those are just some of the sort of traditional ways or, or the, mo the more like typical ways in which politics manifests. Um, politics is the defining and operating of these rule books of aut autonomous decision-making systems and any system that has power over our lives and over our futures. And you know, when, when we're talking about decision-making systems, well, really any decision-making system of this kind is essentially a set of instructions for future interactions, right? Even if it's not implemented in code, even if it's just on paper, because you have a whole system that is built, not just like in a government, but in, in, in a company, for instance, like if there's an internal corporate policy that you know, employees must behave in this way or that, there will be people whose job it is to enforce the rules, otherwise the rules don't exist. And so basically you're designing uh, instructions for future interactions. Does that sound familiar? Like, did anyone here write code ever? Um, yeah, a few of us. Yeah, I, that, I do, right? And so, basically, the thing that I'm trying to get across here is that when you define a technical system, you are making a decision-making system for future interactions, even if it seems innocuous, uh, even if it's not built as a governance system, even if it's just like any kind of interaction modality, like any that building any system of digital technology is actually a political thing that might be applying to a tiny little area. You might not want to think of it as politics because it's, it's, it seems tiny and unimportant, none of the big problems of society, but it is. And so that creates an issue for people who don't like politics, who are not interested in politics, because if you went into tech because you don't like politics, now you have two problems. Um, and I know that this community tends to get this better than most people, than many other communities, but still, it is something that I feel, in general, as technologists broadly, we have not fully internalized the level of power and the level of political influence that we have over people's lives, and we haven't internalized how to think about it in those terms properly. Like, at the end of the day, as technologists, the rule books that we make are in everything. Carl Bildt wrote this article in which he calls the internet the infrastructure of infrastructure. And it's true. And we've been like showing off around it. It's like, yeah, it's cool. It's in, it's in TVs. It's, it's running everything. It's, like, it's, it's in cars. But like, this comes with real responsibility. And it comes with the responsibility to think about these things properly, right? We, we, we make rules for everything. We have a, a say in how pretty much everything operates. We make decisions that impact everyone, right? I've worked a lot on web stuff, 
Um, and that you know, means making decisions for things that go into browsers. And the second something goes into a browser, you know, if, it, if it's adopted by most browsers, you're talking like about impacting the lives of 5 billion people. And so you're, you're in the room and you're deciding, well, is this enough security or should we make it harder to access or should we make it easier to expose you know, geolocation or something like that? This is a decision that affects 5 billion people right away. And so we codify you know, future interactions for people. We might not want to fuck this up. And not fucking this up you know, requires us to think about it a bit more in terms of like, how do we do it right, right? Uh, can't we just make rules that don't shred squirrels? Like, you know, they, 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 you think like, okay, well, okay, yes, I accept my responsibility as a technologist. This is a pretty big deal. It's important. We need to get this right. Um, I'll just make good rules. Well, there are two problems with that. At least two problems, but two big problems. The first is what I call the fundamental theorem of governance, which is basically any, you know, apart from like really stupid cases, any rule-based decision uh, system will be incomplete. Why? Because the real world is really fucking messy. Even if you know it's messy, even if you know it's complicated, even if you know things change and break and are bad, you still don't know how messy it is. It's always worse. It will always surprise you. That's what the real world is about. That's why it's more interesting than the metaverse. Well, it's one of the reasons why it's more interesting than the metaverse, that legs are cool too, I find. Um, and so you can never anticipate every corner case over time. And the thing is, the more complex the situation is, the more corner cases there will be. No one has that level of foresight. And so this means that for any system of rules that has an influence over people's lives, you need some kind of escape hatch out of the rule system. You need something that says like, okay, this is a failure point for the rule system, we need, to hand, we need to have a human in the loop, right? We need to hand the reins back to a group that will sit down, scratch its head together, and go like, okay, what the fuck do we do? This is really complicated. You know, bunch of squirrels here at the airport. Um, is there a squirrel shelter? Can we just like get them all vaccinated? I don't know, you know? Um, and so basically, if you don't have that, you will run into the wall. There's a guarantee that your system will be increasingly distant from reality, and at some point, it will just do something absolutely grotesque or absurd or fail. So that's one of the problems. That means that you can't design rules right, no matter how, how hard you try. The other problem is that some of these questions are really hard. You know, you're, jo you're laughing at this, but I can think of cases where it would be legitimate to eat kittens. I'm not going to go through them right now, but it, you know, it's possible to imagine such cases. And there are many, many decisions in a sufficiently complex world that do not have an obvious right answer. You know, in technology, there's sort of like a bent towards uh, an almost pseudo-scientific belief in the power of science. Like real world scientists actually are yeah, full of doubt and don't like believe that you can science the shit out of everything. They, they want to, that's the job, but they know they can't, right? In tech, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, well, this, we'll just like be scientific about it. You know, we'll just be data-driven. Um, you know, if your process is, if your system, if your company, your process is stupid enough to be data-driven, then you just fire everyone, just like fire the CEO. It's a, it's a pretty simple business, right? Um, most people, most people will agree that you shouldn't, you know, be shredding little squirrels or kittens or pet turtles. Um, but there's many, many questions that are much more contentious than that. And, you know, even, if, even with the question of, of squirrels, like, you know, what happens if people, you know, go like, oh, well, last time, you know, we shipped 400 squirrels, we didn't do the proper paperwork, and, you know, they sorted it at the airport. Well, then why would I pay to, like, you know, get this right before shipping? I'm just, like, going to ship, like, you know, unvaccinated squirrels or whatever the problem was and like rely on the airport to do it for me. And so who bears the cost? You know, um, maybe they just let them through and there's a squirrel pandemic and then everyone's pissed off because all the squirrels are dying. Um, so none of these questions are easy. And so, you know, incomplete systems and hard questions mean that essentially what you're dealing with is a very rugged landscape. A rugged landscape is a landscape on which it is challenging to find the optimum point. You know, if you think of like 
a basic mountain, like a whole landscape, like uh, Kilimanjaro, for instance, is like one big mountain in the middle of a plain. You're like, where's the highest point? Well, it's just like it's up there, right? Um, but if you think of a more complicated landscape, and especially one that's not three-dimensional but has variables that are like n-dimensional, a rugged landscape is a, is, a, is, a case, is a landscape on which it is difficult to find what the optimal point is. And you might find one, but then you have to go down and turn a corner, et cetera, to find the next one. And so, you know, hard, complex problems exist on the rugged landscape of solutions. And in order to work our way through those, um, through those problems, we need a, a way of exploring those landscapes efficiently. And for that, you basically need, need, need things that enable you know, a high signal-to-noise communication between people and freedom of thought. And so those things are basically a lot of communication between people um, so that you can have intellectual diversity with, in which the information is spread. And you need equality. That is something that people often miss because people think, well, if there's a right answer, you know, we'll just like all agree to it and power doesn't matter. But that's not true. If you don't have equality, that means a powerful voice with an inferior solution can prop their own idea up over those of others. And so essentially, if you want efficient exploration of a rugged landscape by a bunch of agents, they need to be diverse and communicating with each other, and they need to be treating one another as equals. There's a technical term for a system that works that way. It's called a democracy. And People you know, tend to not think of democracy that way, but like, that really is what makes something democratic. And we'll get into details uh, about that, but first I'd like to make like, a quick observation, which is if you also look at these characteristics, well, they look a lot like, you know, if you squint a bit, they look a lot like the peer-to-peer -peer systems that people have been building, right? You, know, the, you have like, these agents that are generally relatively equal, and that communicate with each other and can be implemented along lines of diverse uh, hardware and, and situation. And the reason for that is because what a lot of people will call decentralized, which you know, at this point has gone through so many definitions, it probably doesn't mean anything much anymore. What people mean by decentralized, what the word decentralized is a euphemism for democratic. And we don't need fucking euphemisms. We should like, you know, understand what the words mean and use the correct words, which in this case is democratic. So you're like, but Robin, what the fuck? You know, like the characteristics you list don't mention voting. Like I thought democracies were about voting. It so happens that in the 18th century, when people started, you know, to, to try to do democracy again after, after forgetting about it for, for a couple of millennia, um, voting was sort of the best thing uh, that they could figure that they could think about for, for that kind of scale. If you went back to classical Athens. Um, people wouldn't have considered voting to be the best option necessarily. Like a lot of democratic decisions were done by random sampling. You know, you take, you know, it's, stock it's stockocratic. You take a random sampling of like 100 people in the city and you put them in charge of, of decisions for that day or for that week or whatever. Um, and that's very democratic. Like it's, it, it's actually, you're actually getting representation from everyone um, in a way that, that changes over time. It's very equalitarian. You know, in the 18th century, they were much more like, okay, we want democ democracy, but we don't want those peasants to like decide too much, right? Um, and so the idea was really much that you'd have an elite and people would vote for like which part of the elite they dislike the least, which might seem familiar from what it's become today. Um, and, you know, that is why if you're thinking of the properties of something that are democratic, really think of voting as only an implementation detail that is useful as an approximation sometimes, but really it's not something that we should jump to. Like we shouldn't live in the unexamined assumptions we have from the um, 18th century. And again, you know, this is also a, a, the kind of conversation where people can go like, hey, tokenomics, that solves everything, right? Um, but the problem with that is that really politics is more fun fundamental than economics because that's what sets the rules for the other, right? And you cannot like optimize your way to incentive for complex problems. That just doesn't happen. And so you'd still need to debate it first to pick what you're going to optimize for. There is no uh, obvious right answer. And in general, like again, voting 
is really something that if you do it without proper deliberation, without proper information, is just not going to deliver any kind of good results. Without informed deliberation, any optimal voting system is just an aggregation of preferences and it will opt, you know, it might be optimal, but it will just like be the aggregation of dumb fuckery. And I keep seeing this over and over again. Like I look at all these DAOs and these RPGF systems and they're like, oh yeah, we're voting on stuff. You know, this is democratic, it's great. And then they're like, oh, we'll tinker with a voting system. I, I think I have a better electoral method than the other. But then you look at the information and the debate and the deliberation that happens with it. And you're like, wait, hang on. There's like for every project, there's like a little icon and like a two sentence blurb and no one's debating the merits of these things. Like there is no informed decision making and you can vote all you want with no information. You're just making shit up. There's no point. And so the idea is that really the foundations of democracy, but also the, 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 the things that make democracy the most intelligent system that you can have are specifically these properties of the ability to explore complex decisions and rank complex things in valuable ways. And so fundamentally, you need to do deliberation through equality and information in order to get properly democratic outputs and in order to get like the real intelligence that democracy is about. Democracy is that you, you, you don't even have to think of it as like a morally superior system. Like we don't have to care about, about that. It is just the most efficient system in terms of being intelligent when looking for solutions to complex problems on a rugged landscape. And that is, again, deliberation and equality. There's an interesting corollary to that, is that all these people who you know, are like, oh, we don't want deliberation, we don't want you know, equality, uh, you know, we don't, again, like, it's tempting to go to morals to, 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 to talk about this. It's like, oh, this is bad, you know, it's bad. But at the end of the day, the corollary from the fact that democracy is about intelligence is that these people are just stupidity activists. And you know, there's no need to go beyond that. It's just like, why would you want to support, you know, morons um, in, 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 and have like a less intelligent society? There's no point. There's no point. Even, even if it were morally better, it would still be stupid. And of course it's not. And so, spoiler alert, this talk is not actually about squirrels. I know I've mentioned squirrels a few times, but, um, you know, I, I think finding a good process to not kill squirrels might be important, but there's a takeaway message that is actually not about squirrels. And the idea is that really, with, first with digital tech, everything we build is a relatively autonomous and more autonomous than it used to be decision-making system. We've created a new bureaucracy that's just more effective than the previous bureaucracy. Like code is, is bureaucracy. And any such system is incomplete and wrong. And with these technical systems, we keep creating new points of control, new choke points. And basically these choke points, like you know, for every computing system, there has to be like a reference to a given choke point. And if someone controls that choke point, they control the process, right? You can think of, there's a great David Clark paper from 2012 in which he talks about control point analysis. And he goes into details where he's like, well, if you want to load a page, you have, the computer has to do all these things from like, actually someone had to buy the computer, pre-install an OS, put a browser on it, DNS resolution, HTML parsing, et cetera, et cetera. Every single one of those steps creates a control point. If someone owns that control point, they actually control the loading of a page, right? And that, and that means controlling search matters, controlling DNS matters, controlling browsers matters, controlling defaults on installs matters. And again, every time someone captures this, they reduce equality, they reduce our ability to communicate, and therefore they make us stupider. And we need to, we need to make sure that we diffuse power uh, around this. Third, we need accountability sinks with humans in the loop. Otherwise, we won't be able to solve complex problems. That is the only option we have. And at the end of the day, democracy is not about the implementations that we know about, but they're about um, sharing information uh, about our exploration of diverse methods and egalitarian um, deliberation with proper information of people. I know that's a lot, but I wanted to put it all on the slide. And you might feel that I've cheated you out of something because the, the title of its talk was like the, the public interest internet. And the thing is, the truth is 
once we implement things this way, we don't need to think about what the public interest internet because the process is how we implement it. The doing is how we get there. Um, and essentially, public interest is public intelligence. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>